Good morning, everybody. Um, it um, is Thursday morning, and um, we have uh, members uh, and guests from Roll Vermont, <clears throat> along with members uh, from the Ag Agency, as well as this is a joint hearing between uh, with the House Ag Committee <clears throat> and the Senate Ag Committee. So it's it's great to see uh, so many of you on Zoom. That um, it's been working quite well. Um, you know, no different it has been for the last two years, except for now we're we as a committee are in Montpelier. Um, and the House Committee uh, is also in Montpelier. And uh, I'd like to have, our, this is in regard, the whole meeting is in regards to on-farm slaughter. And uh, so Carolyn, would, would you like to introduce uh, your members that are in the room and then I'll introduce ours and we'll get started with the meeting. All right, well, thanks, Bobby. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here today uh, with this hot topic uh, that is of concern for all of us. Um, in the room, uh, we have Representative Tom Bach from Chester, uh, Representative Terry Norris from Shoreham, and I'm Carolyn Partridge from the town of Wyndham. Uh, Heather Supernaut is stuck in the mud in Barnard, and uh, there she is, she has a little tile. And I think um, some of our other members, John O'Brien, Vicki Strong, and Henry Pearl, uh, as well as Rodney Graham, are going to be kind of dribbling in as they make it over the icy roads. I've heard that they're terrible. So um, at any rate, we're pleased to be here today. And, and Bobby, thanks so much for giving us an opportunity to introduce ourselves. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. <clears throat> And um, we have Brian, Senator Brian Collimore from Rutland uh, in the room, uh, Senator Corey Parent in the room, Anthony Polina um, is on the opposite end of a mud road. And uh, so he is an end, but on Zoom. And Chris Pearson should be joining us uh, in a moment or two. And I'm Senator Bobby Starr from Troy. Um, we also have uh, Linda Lehman, who works for both committees uh, with us, as well as Michael O'Grady, our uh, chief legislative council person uh, with us. And um, I don't know if uh, we also have on the Zoom, uh, Julie uh, Bobear, and I, I think is, uh, is uh, Steve with us and Steve Collier from the Agency of Ag. And uh, to start with, we have one question uh, for the Ag Agency uh, and Steve, I don't know if you want to answer the question or if Julie does, but <clears throat> the one question is, has anything changed with the uh, on-farm slaughter rules and regulations in the last uh, couple of years? Good, good morning, Senator Starr. Steve Collier from the Agency of Agriculture, and thanks so much for having us. The short answer is no. It, it hasn't okay, changed. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> so now, we, now we know that the rules and the regs have not changed in the propaganda that some of us have been hearing, uh, I would say is propaganda, unless, Michael, did you have anything? Do you mean from FSIS? Yes, or the Ag Agents. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I don't have anything. I, I, I think basically what you're saying is that there's no official opinion on the change of interpretation from FSIS. Yes. So you don't know of any, yeah. Uh, I have not seen anything official. Yeah. 
Uh, so folks, uh, I don't know if, so I wanted to get that on the table early on so that we don't run astray of what we're trying to achieve uh, is clarity and uh, a clear direction for you folks that do on-farm slaughter. Uh, and, uh, you know, let's try to use our time positive. And if you have suggestions that would help you and we can achieve those uh, goals, uh, you know, we just want to be able to allow you folks to function in a, you know, in a easy, peaceful, humane way to supply beef to our people of uh, Vermont. Uh, so Caroline, would you like to lead off and introduce your guest as we, uh, as you want to call on them? I can do I can do that, Senator. So good morning, both committees and every everyone joining us here today. I'm Caroline Gordon, Legislative Director with Rural Vermont. Um, I will not walk through our lineup in this very moment. I'm happy to pass the mic as we go. Um, I kind of wanted to just set the stage today um, with presenting a sign-on letter that we submitted to the committees um, today that we've been circulating over the last months uh, since we heard uh, what we receive as new policies from our state agency of agriculture. So I'm just taking a minute to read that here um, to set the stage. We received to that letter over 152 signatures. Um, and when I'm done, um, I'll pass it on to our legislative intern, uh, Elena Roick, who will uh, read for you some written testimonials um, that we also collect, collected alongside with this letter. Dear legislators, a community of small scale farmers who struggle to find nearby meat processing facilities that meet their needs and who decided it would be best for the animals to be slaughtered on the farm where they were raised need your support. On farm slaughters being penalized with new restrictions that the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets announced January 6, 2022, as coming from the superseding federal agency, the Food Safety Inspection Service, FSIS. These new restrictions now require every livestock owner who purchased the animal from a farmer for its slaughter on the farm to be at least present during the act of slaughter, if not engaging also in the slaughter themselves. In testimony, VAFM staff further stated that farmers who organize on farm slaughter would not be allowed to hire itinerant slaughterers on behalf of the owners of the livestock they raise. Finally, VAFM penalizes those who demand local meat in direct relationship to their farmer by stating in testimony to the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee that the agency would understand the owners and not farmers need to be the ones to transport the carcass off the farm and to the butcher. Sincerely, would you have the skill, vehicle, and machinery to transport a quarter of a cow? We have not seen any of these restrictions in writing coming from FSIS in guidance, nor can we find related provisions in state or federal law. Rural Vermont members of the agricultural community have successfully advocated for over a decade to improve Vermont state law through the democratic process, just to find these laws not implemented, supported, or yet even promoted by our state agency. In consequence, many practitioners refrain, uh, remain confused about the legalities of on-farm slaughter and rather continue to operate under the radar. We are grateful for the legislators of the Senate Ag Committee on Agriculture support in reaching out to FSIS via letter from January 31st, 2022 stating, there's no reference in the FSIS guidance to a requirement that all owners be physically present at the site of the slaughter. And frankly, we do not know if this requirement is documented anywhere. Signatories kindly ask legislators to consider the urgency that farmers face now that spring is here and a new generation of livestock sold for being slaughtered on the farm where they were raised is being born. Without the confidence that BAFM will not enforce against their practice, without sufficient legal basis, these farmers might lose their good standing with the agency and thus access to any future state support for their agricultural practices. 
After the legislature allowed for multiple owners per, anim per animal in 2019, repealed the sunset of 6 VSA section 3311A and increased the allowances for on-farm slaughter in 2021 to now 10 cattle, 30 swine or 80 sheep or goats, we now ask to repeal the registration and reporting requirements for farmers who organize on-farm slaughter in 6 VSA section 3311A subsection C2 and 8. While we desire VAFM to promote on-farm slaughter in Vermont, this measure appears urgently needed to protect practitioners now. So with that, we're here today to share what is the status quo of on-farm slaughter and how these new policies penalize practitioners. I want to add that we question it being the, in the discretion of the administration of the law to render the same impractical or sheer unrealizable. To add another layer of complexity, I also want to bring to the committee's attention that farmers have extreme difficulty to find insurance companies that support them, given the confusion and irregularities around this issue. And with that, I pass it on to Elena. <clears throat> Thank you, Caroline, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena Roig. I'm the legislative intern with Rural Vermont. Um, and like Caroline said, we distributed that sign-on letter, and in that sign-on letter, we gave folks a space to provide a testimonial on how uh, restrictions to on-farm slaughter impact them personally. Um, so when I compiled this document that we've shared with you, um, when I compiled it yesterday, there were just under 100 written testimonials provided that amounted to about nine pages. Um, as of this morning, that has grown to uh, over 100 testimonials. So I just wanted to share um, that it was about a 60-40 split of uh, farmers to 40% of the signatories were farmers, 60% were um, anybody who kind of didn't identify themselves in that type of way, um, so consumers um, and the like. So I just wanted to share a few of these testimonies with you um, just to kind of give uh, some of these perspectives, um, give you guys the opportunity to hear some additional perspectives. Uh, so from an anonymous farmer, as a new and growing livestock farm, we would like to be able to confidently offer on-farm slaughter as an option to consumers. The logistical challenges and marketing slash consumer education needed with the current changes essentially mean that on-farm slaughter would be very difficult to incorporate as a viable business option, leaving us to struggle to find slaughter dates, stress our animals with transportation, and lose the flexibility and control that on-farm slaughter allows over the process. From another anonymous farmer, we exclusively use on-farm slaughter to process our animals. We would have to stop producing meat for our customers. Another anonymous farmer, we raise and process many animals on farm. This would greatly impact our ability to remain in business. From another farmer, our pork has always been humanely slaughtered on farm and transported cleanly by our butcher back to his facility for custom cutting. Our customers have no desire to be part of the slaughter process and are not equipped to transport whole hogs from the, from the farm to a butcher shop for cutting and wrapping. For this reason, we have decided after 17 years of producing pasture raised organically fed pork to cease operation in this department until a more reasonable solution is found. Our customers are devastated. They either cannot get pork from any of the other operations we've referred them to or are choosing not to because they value the stress-free option of on-farm slaughter for the animals. From another farmer, as a farmer directly helping feed our community, it's very challenging to secure USDA slaughter dates, if not impossible in many cases. This year, we, will, we were able to only find 80% of the slaughter spots we need and will be required to truck animals two hours to the, to the slaughterhouse. We also have many community members who seek out meat from on-farm slaughtered animals for both animal welfare and affordability reasons, and we would like to be able to support their needs and wishes. From direct experience, I can say confidently that on-farm slaughter can provide the highest animal welfare value and food safety. I also don't believe legislation should be inhibiting or obstructing consumer food choices. From a farmer in Derby, 
I currently sell half and whole beef animals to individuals as well as for home use. Depending on availability, I use both a slaughterhouse or on-farm slaughter. I can never get enough space at one of the slaughter facilities I use, so having this flexibility means that I can better serve my customers and can use several different cutting facilities that don't offer slaughter. From an anonymous farmer, we have a small sheep farm and currently use on-farm slaughter to provide meat to our family and shareholders. Local slaughterhouses are full. We can't get on their list. The animals that we slaughter are far less stressed because there is no transport. Animals that are not used to transport get highly stressed when, we, when transported and then they're stressed at the slaughterhouse facility. Our animals are not stressed ever in this way. If we can't do on-farm slaughter, slaughter, we would stop raising sheep. Uh, and finally, I'd like to wrap it up with a testimonial from a custom butcher. I am trained as a butcher and have worked exclusively in small shops that specialize in ethical butchery. I have seen firsthand the care that small farmers and individual homesteaders take with their animals. And I'm also intimately familiar with the cost and burden of having to transport livestock to a slaughter facility, especially for small farmers. Vermont has an incredible history of reverence with food through hunting, foraging, and farming. On-farm slaughter is an important part of that care and reverence, not to mention that it increases the quality of the meat that we consume. Less travel means a calmer animal, which means less adrenaline and cortisol release, which in turn results in higher quality meat. With a looming climate crisis, it is important that Vermont continues to lead the way in cherishing practices that divest from reliance on national agribusiness and instead invest in local care and practices. So those are just a few of the testimonials that we received um, in our sign on letter. Like I said, there were well over 100 as of this morning, um, and I appreciate the time to get to share some of those with you. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's a joint effort of Rural Vermont and NOFA Vermont to organize these small farm action days. So we're excited to have Bill Cavanaugh from NOFA Vermont here to offer their perspective. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to just thank everybody at the outset for their time today. It's always great to um, get a chance to meet with, with both committees, um, bring farmers' voices directly into the conversation. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, this is the second of our um, sort of joint small farm action day series that we put on with rural Vermont. Um, and we look forward to seeing everybody again in April for the final um, when Maddie Kempner, our policy director, will be back. I'm sort of sitting in her seat today. So my name is Bill Cavanaugh. I'm a farm business advisor with NOFA Vermont. Before coming to NOFA, I worked um, for over a decade in the meat industry. Um, and I do still work part time uh, as a custom butcher, as well as um, I teach the meat cutting classes at Vermont Tech. So um, I look at this from a lot of perspectives, but I am wearing my, my NOFA hat today. I want to say at the outset, um, I've worked really closely with the Vermont Meat Inspection Team over the years, um, led by Julie. Um, I see them as really key partners uh, in ensuring reliable, safe meat is available to all Vermonters. That said, the inspection team is beholden to sort of implement the letter of the law and to maintain equal to status in regards to federal meat regulations. So there's kind of a tension there. So we really strongly support whatever can be done legislatively to support Vermont's on farm slaughter. In my work, I'm really fortunate to work very closely with businesses in Vermont's meat sector across the entire spectrum of scale. So I work with the smallest livestock farmers all the way up to the, the largest slaughter and processing facilities in the state. Um, I see firsthand that farm slaughter is hugely important, not just for farmers who sell their meat um, that way, and, and it is hugely important for them, um, but also for the entire meat supply chain as a whole. Uh, I don't think I need to tell anybody here today that there's a, a pretty major bottleneck that exists in slaughter and processing here in Vermont. Um, there are plenty of people really hard at work at solving that problem and farm slaughter on farm slaughter has been really long identified as a great way for farmers to sell their meat without having to go to a commercial slaughterhouse. Um, without a viable option to sell farm slaughtered and custom butchered meat, these farms will be forced into the queue at Vermont's inspected slaughterhouses, which will further exacerbate an already tenuous situation. Farms that don't even engage in on-farm slaughter will lose slaughter spots that have increased wait times. Um, and those farms that do practice on-farm slaughter um, could experience you know, an increase in costs that could very well lead them to go out of business. So there's, there's a knock-on effect when we, when we kind of restrict the ability to, to slaughter on farm and sell that meat, not just for those particular farms who are affected, but for, for the entire supply chain. 
Um, and so that's the effect on farmers. Um, for consumers of locally produced meat, they're going to lose out as well. Um, you know, one of the traditions that we really hold so dear in Vermont is being able to know your farmer and be able to know that the animal you're buying for meat has had a good life. Um, Vermont's commercial slaughter facilities do a great job, and there are many consumers who, who are, you know, that's how they purchase their meat, but many don't. Um, they want to sort of be able to, to know their farmer directly, know the animal directly, and, and know that it didn't have the stress of a, of a transport or, you know, having to go through a, a large commercial facility. Um, so we feel that with diminished access to on-farm slaughter, those customers will likely end up purchasing more of their meat as retail cuts, um, which means they'll have to navigate shelves stocked with competing out-of-state and national brands. So again, sort of that knock-on effect on consumers of you know, they they were able to sort of purchase, um, you know, more locally and, and with a with a farmer that they know well, and now they're into a much larger sort of retail um, environment. So it's our position that without reliable access to on-farm slaughter um, as an option, small farmers are going to see increased costs, they're going to see diminished market share, um, and consumers of locally raised meat will have less options for meat um, that they feel good about. So... Um, we really encourage whatever can be done um, from the from the legislators end um, up to and including, you know, repealing the, the registration reporting requirements for farm farm slaughter. But that's yeah. it. I just wanted to give my, my perspective and I, I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Yeah, much appreciated, Bill. And then we want to hear from Mary Lake, who's been with us in testimony many, many times over the decade. Mary, um, um, we're excited to hear from you today, today as well. Hi, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've been in the meat industry for about 12 years now and started out um, at a USDA plant. And um, gathered a lot, gathered my skills there and a lot of knowledge about um, efficiencies and inefficiencies and how we can make um, our Vermont ag community um, and meat production better and what we can do for that. Um, so what I do now um, after leaving the inspected plant is I have been doing on-farm slaughter um, I have, as an itinerant slaughterer for other farms um, for the past few years. Um, and I've built a business doing this in accordance with the allowances and the regulations and, um, and have shared and, and encouraged many struggling farms to use on farm slaughter um, to stay in the meat business. Uh, with that bottleneck that we talked about and COVID causing many um, shortages, um, many slaughterhouses are full and some are not taking sheep and goats at all. Um, I think a lot of you know I also work pretty closely with the Vermont Sheep and Goat Association and I'm a lamb producer myself so I really focused on the impact of all of this on sheep and goats. Um, so what we're seeing now is this like kind of decrease in capacity at slaughterhouses and an increase in demand for our meat. So the increased demand for local meat, you know, kind of stems from COVID and for this trend to continue, meat producers really need processing options like OFS, on-farm slaughter. And what makes on-farm slaughter viable um, is the relationship that the farmer has with the consumers or the animal owners and the relationship that the farmer has with the itinerant slaughterer. So, Farmers hire me or hire itinerant slaughterers to come to the farm and per perform the act of slaughter. And the itinerant slaughterers have skills that have taken a lot of time and experience to acquire. And the skills make on-farm slaughter safer and efficient um, and therefore really viable. So the system is working really well um, for the most part for farmers and consumers and their animals. And new policies would impact the system negatively um, by creating inefficiencies. You know. With the profit margins being so slim, um, that could really le lead to a weakened agricultural system and the loss of some small farms. Um, I've had many farmers tell me, um, well, as a sheep shearer and as an itinerant slaughterer, like if 
we didn't have you, we wouldn't be able to have a sheep farm. And so um, when policy seems to get threatened, I get uh, really nervous and for my own business, but also for the 300 plus farms that I go to for shearing and some of those also do on farm slaughter. Um, so some of the benefits of working with an itinerant slaughterer um, are that the farmer gets to see um, the slaughter. It would be super efficient to have, or inefficient to have the owners all there seeing it and it wouldn't be as beneficial to them. Um, but having, but organizing everything with the farmer has a lot of benefits that, um, that help make their farms more efficient and more um, knowledgeable about what they're creating. Um, so if you think about uh, when a farmer gets to see the slaughter or be a part of the slaughter, they are being like scientists and there's like all these little tips that we look at or all these signs that we look at and things that we measure to know how our animals are doing and to know how to move forward with our own um, farm practices and on-farm slaughter helps a lot with that, especially when you have an itinerant slaughterer there who kind of sees lots of animals from all over every day. Um, and I just fear that new policies would really um, lead to farmers not being able to create the best food possible for their communities, we would we would really see a loss. And that's what I'm most afraid of. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, did you, Mary, did you say you cover 300 farms or you go to 300 farms or did I hear that wrong? Yeah, not for on-farm slaughter. So, um, my farm business is mostly shearing and the on-farm slaughter aspect of my business has grown a lot in the past couple of years. So when I'm out shearing, um, you know, they, they, these are all sheep farms. We are also talking about their animals and their farm management and what they do for slaughter and what they do for meat production. So even if I'm not doing on-farm slaughter for them. Uh, we're talking about other options and who their local itinerant slaughter would be. And um, on-farm slaughter has been such a great option for sheep and goat producers. Um, I don't know exactly how many farms I go to for on-farm slaughter, but it's not 300, it's more like 100 or yeah. less. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And now we want to want to hear from a sheep farmer who is practicing on from slaughter. So we have Kurt Patterson here with us today from Shincracker Icelandic Sheep Farm in Heartland, Vermont. Hi, that's who I am. Although it's Peter's son, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mary. By the way, uh, I really appreciated hearing from because she is an angel for sheep farmers all over the state. Without her, I don't know if the industry would survive. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we sell about a dozen to 15 lamb shares a year. They're uh, registered uh, purebred Icelandic sheep. Our customers come back every year and they know exactly how our process works. Uh, we sell them the lamb, it's theirs. Uh, from the start and we raise it for them as their agent. We uh, make sure that they have fresh water and good beautiful Vermont grass to eat. Uh, they get veterinary care when they need it. They're protected from predators and parasites as best we can. And then we hire uh, on behalf of the owner an itinerant slaughterer who is very experienced and uh, he even insists on uh, killing the sheep uh, out of the sight of the other sheep so that they're not stressed out in any way. Um, 
he uh, uh, then we transport for the owner the lambs to a clean butcher shop where they are uh, cut up and uh, wrapped, labeled, shrink wrapped, labeled, and fit hard frozen. And then we bring them back to the farm, put them in our freezer, and the owner comes and picks up his or her sheep. Um, the best lamb they've ever eaten is what they all say without a, an exception. And I can tell you <clears throat> that the methods that we use or are used on our behalf and on the owner's behalf are humane. Uh, not, you know, it's not one of these big operations where the calves or the lambs are bunched up together and raised uh, for muscle mass. It's clean because we're right there making sure that it's clean and the butcher shops that we have used have been very clean. Uh, it produces safe food for the people who buy it. Uh, and uh, frankly, it's financially uh, necessary to raise uh, a sheep. Um, I'm to quote my father in law, late father in law, uh, the object in raising sheep is not to make money. It's to lose the least amount of money you have to. So the margins, <laughs> as Mary said, <laughs> the margins, as Mary said, are very slim. And uh, it's, uh, someone told me the other day that he plays music at the Harpoon Brewery to support his sheep habit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's pretty much the way it is. It's worked so well for a number of years and, the, and as I've dug through pounds and pounds of materials on the subject, my question is who gains by uh, the changes that are in the wind? Uh, certainly <laughs> big ag is not going to be affected by whether or not small farmers in Vermont use on-farm slaughter. They uh, are, are land buyers are getting <clears throat> safe, clean food that's really cared for. People who worry about animals are seeing meat produced in the most humane way. Um, I, I, and it enables small farmers to exist uh, with or without profit. And I, I just don't understand what, what the driving force is for any of these suggested changes. It, it just none of them have any logical sense. And thank you for listening to me rant. <clears throat> thank you, Kurt. Hey, how many years have you been doing this? Eight, sir. Yeah, yeah thank you. Any problems? Problems? What kind of problems, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I guess you haven't had any, so that's good. Well, no, uh, raising Icelandic sheep is an honor. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Kurt. And we also have Brendan Bless from Bread and Butter Farm with us today to speak to the issue. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Bless. I'm a uh, land and animal manager at Bread and Butter Farm in Southern and South Carolina. Um, I think I'd really just like to emphasize a lot of the points that were, were already made. So I, just picking up where Kurt left off there, I think what what is the benefit and what is the sense of the of limiting on farm slaughter in this way? I understand food safety is the principal matter, but uh, you yeah. know, if you're as we're describing it here, Caroline, we are very well. Bre Brennan, there's a little bit. Um, Disturbing noise, wind, and such in your in your microphone. Um, any chance you can protect your phone a little better? Yeah, is that better? Much better. Great. Um, yeah, I just picking up where Kurt left off there. I think that I really just stress that point of what's the benefit here, and that I think back to Bobby Starr, your your original comment of let's speak positively and creatively. I think the positive and creative approach is how do we do on farm slaughter as well as we possibly can for the farm community, the itinerant slaughter community, 
in the consumer community that this is, this is a real demand that we experience on our farm and we cannot serve or satisfy because of the way that the current legislation and regulation is um, particularly being a you know quote unquote higher profile farm it's it's really hard to fly under the radar as many other farms do um, and I think a lot of uh, potential changes or limitations in the regulation and or legislation of on-prem slaughter is just going to return us to where we kind of began, which is a lot of it going on just totally unregulated and under the radar, which, you know, I, I guess there's pros and cons to that. Um, but yeah, just to Kurt's point that I, I, I just don't see the benefit of, of further limiting or stressing this community that is already under quite a lot of stress. And when I say this community, I'm sort of combining the the on-farm slaughter offering farmer community, as well as, you know, really master cast people like Mary. Um, you know, this is a really hard time for everyone. And Even just getting slaughter spots with USDA facility is pretty much impossible right now. So to just take something that is kind of the the best thing that we have on the table to take that off the table or to further limit that i think is is exactly the wrong direction it is not the positive approach that um bobby star left led us with there um i also wanted to just pick up on uh, a couple other points so i think um just back to caroline in the beginning you know this has been quite a journey and i think what i've seen in my limited time being involved is positive progression and positive movement. It's been for me as a farmer, excruciatingly slow, but it's been positive. And I think this is, I'm identifying this as a huge step backwards um, from what we're talking about today. And I, I think that, that again, that trajectory, it just doesn't make sense. There's not a logic to it or rationale in my mind. I, I think I can understand sort of the federal that Bill picked up on sort of the federal versus state push and pull there and needing to reconcile that. So I'd be really eager to see and participate in a really positive, proactive approach that engages the federal government and policy on that level so that we can move into a better and more positive place while right here, right now, we take a stand to actually protect our itinerant slaughter and former and consumer community. And, and I think, you know, if consumers are making these conscious choices about their own food and their food safety and where their food is coming from, I don't see a need or a rationale for regulation or legislation to stand in between, you know, it's a really short chain from that animal to that consumer in this case. So I don't see a need to, to stand in the way there. I, I like Bill's point also about how do we, uh, you know, maybe make the current legislation a little bit more uh, approachable and easy and easy for others to engage um, and anything that we can do here and now to sort of uh, to at least even if it's minor work to sort of soften um, what the legislation or regulation is, is doing within the community so I think Bill pointed out sort of the registration requirements and either removing or softening those or I've said in the past if there's a way to just make that a lot easier for farmers to engage with it's not always the easiest process to um, register and report. I think that's all I have, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. <clears throat> yeah, good to hear from you. And then I'm not sure we have also a couple of um, customers of Unfarm Slaughter lined up here. And uh, next on my list would be Connie Gun Gunter. And I'm not sure if who we have on the display here as Daphne <laughs> might be actually the tile for Connie. Um, so Connie, are you on the on the call here? Just testing. And if not, then we just um, you know, if Connie joins as we go, um, Linda, let me know. Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to Ali Berlo. Hello. Morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. My name is Allie Burlow. Thank you. I want to say, first of all, thank you for your session. I live in Putney on the unceded lands of the Abenaki people, which is a matter of historical record. And I consider myself extremely lucky, lucky to be a neighbor to a small sheep farm, boondoggle farm, where Katie Wolf raises a flock of fin sheep, a heritage breed. I'm here today to testify and to state unequivocally 
that I support the repeal of the registration and report requirements for farmers who practice on farm slaughter. I'm here to bear witness that me and my family would be adversely affected if on farm slaughter were to become unavailable to Vermont farmers. Please allow me the time to say why. Thank you. I am an eater who has actively supported small, medium sized family farms and fisheries since the early 2000s. I'm a writer. I've written about food and food systems for close to 20 years via public radio, community radio, and magazines. I founded a sustainable ag nonprofit, Island Grown Initiative. I have authored two books published by Story Publishing on these issues and experiences the Food Activist Handbook in 2015, and in 2013, the Mobile Poultry Slaughterhouse, Building a Humane Chicken Processing Unit to Strengthen Your Local Food System, to which my friend Temple Grandin wrote the foreword. I also have a Master of Food and Agriculture, Law and Policy from Vermont Law School, Class of 2020. Let me be clear, I'm not a farmer, nor will I become a farmer. I consider myself an advocate for food sovereignty and food access. I consider my health and well being inextricably linked to the economic health and well being of small and mid sized farmers in Vermont. In my opinion, unfarmed slaughter here in Vermont provides access to safe, humane, clean, traceable, size appropriate infrastructure that meets small families' needs that is otherwise unavailable to these farmers because of limited access to brick and mortar slaughterhouses which is one of the consequences of the national and international corporate consolidation of livestock and meat production. And as COVID has proven and continues to do so in the breakdown of food supply chains, local and regional brick and mortar slaughterhouses are booked to capacity for months and sometimes years, and often miles away, creating yet another barrier to farmers, long, expensive and stressful travel. As has been stated clearly by farmers here, the transportation of livestock causes stress on live animals and results in a diminished quality of both life and of end product. Itinerant slaughterers like Mary Lake are highly skilled professionals. They do jobs that frankly, most of us do not want to do, nor do we know how to do. If you've been to a slaughter, you probably experienced some level of discomfort, awe, and a reckoning. If you're a farmer or have witnessed or participated in an unfarmed slaughter, you know that the best case scenario, in the best case scenario, calm prevails. Humans and animals are safe. Livestock are treated humanely and with dignity. The farm is quiet, ready and prepared. It has potable water, access to hot water and refrigeration, appropriate composting at the ready, and a safe setup for the itinerant slaughter. <laughs> All these things are important and integral to the humane handling of livestock, food safety, the safety of the humans, and the quality of the end product. It's quite a logistical feat for a farmer to raise both animals and provide a safe environment into which, in, in which to slaughter them. However, if owners, the citizen eaters of animal shares for unfarmed slaughter are required to organize unfarmed slaughter events and are also required to be present for unfarmed on farm slaughtered days. What was calm preparedness immediately transforms into unnecessary chaotic logistical nightmare. With so many more moving parts and more human beings who are probably mostly untrained than necessary. And most importantly, it sets up an illogical double standard that goes against a farm safety, biosecurity, liability, animal and food safety, and data protection for the private customer. Moreover, people, these regular customers slash eaters like me would be required to witness and participate in slaughter and processing activities, to take days off from work, school, or their families, one, two, possibly three days in a row, depending on the number of animals. What about traffic? Boondoggle Farm, my neighbor, we live up a pretty decent hill and off a dead end dirt road, which most vehicles are not suited for. What about parking? bathrooms, shoes, <laughs> and people tracking unknown biological materials. People bring dogs to farms, even though it's a really bad idea. And what about proper refrigeration and transportation? I repeat, this is burdensome and nonsensical, reckless and unsub unsubstantiated in my opinion. However, the benefits of unfarmed slaughter are that it provides the shortest food chain supply possible 
resulting in the most transparency possible. This is safety contained. During COVID, we all experienced and continue to experience a breakdown of big ag meat supply chains. Big, as Temple Grandin will say, is fragile. If we've learned anything from COVID's rampage through our international and national supply chains is that local and regional supply chains are nimble and responsive. They are much more transparent and hence arguably safer. The new, the new restrictions from the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets threaten farmers' livelihoods and way of life. They also threaten me, the eater's choice and right to purchase the food they want. Here's a cautionary statement. When you turn a blind eye to unfarmed slaughter and or make punitive or burdensome requirements upon the farmer, I argue that you, the legislators, are perpetuating and supporting an unfarmed meat system. Please do not look away because the topic of slaughter is in of itself challenging. Punitive requirements for farmers and their customers also threatens, in my opinion, Vermont's very own public outward facing persona and trusted brand of Vermont made or Vermont grown. Because when you take away or threaten the small and mid-sized farmers of Vermont's ability to do business, there's no more there there when it comes to Vermont's purported brand. As these farmers are threatened and continue to be frankly betrayed by an agency that purportedly is there to support them as they have been burdened with regulations and interpretations of said regulations that have no basis in reality, then this brand, this Vermont brand is left as a hollowed out shell, a greenwashing PR campaign for corporations and their lobbyists like Unilever, Tyson, Cargill, JBS and National Beef. So I asked as an eater, why is there this relationship of intimidation, of deaf ear, of burdensome and random requirements determined to penalize eaters and farmers between the agency and the people. It seems to me this relationship is damaged and fractured and an imbalance of power yielded, unsubstantiated. However, if and when you, the state, work with transparency, with a real and true understanding of what small and mid-sized Vermont farmers and itinerant slaughterers do and the issues they face on the ground, when it comes to raising, slaughtering, and processing livestock, then together, the Vermont Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets, including its bureaucrats, and all the eaters, including all the farmers, can work, can work towards a common, scaled, reasonable goals and outcomes. In closing, I reiterate, I am here to testify and to state unequivocally that I support the repeal of the registration and report requirements for I'm here to bear witness that me, my family, and the state of Vermont and the Vermont far farmers would be adversely affected if unfarmed slaughter were to become unavailable. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Allie. Um, Caroline? Yeah, thank you, Allie. That was really powerful. And <clears throat> we're almost through with our list and agenda for the event. We have um, two more. Um, Rural Vermont family member, so to speak, Celine de Soucy uh, is a farm business planner for the Center for Agricultural Economy. But for full disclosure, Celine is also a Rural Vermont board member, and we're excited to hear from you today, Celine. Thanks, Caroline. Um, yeah, I work. My name is Celine. I work um, as a farm business planner for the Center for an Agricultural Economy over in Hardwick. So maybe also adding a perspective from. Um, some more northern, northeastern farms. Um, so the, a large portion of my clients are dairy farms under 100 cows, both conventional and organic. Um, and I see on-farm slaughter as an essential piece in the puzzle of farm profitability, farm community, and a real local food system where real locals, um, especially up here, can consume local meat. Um, on-farm slaughter is an option that many farmers choose to procure to procure local meat that they themselves can afford to eat, which is becoming harder and harder. I don't know if you guys know what the beef price is now, but I've had a lot of my clients be like, I don't think we can afford to eat our beef anymore. Um, you know, if it would be processed um, through USDA, um, the prices are high and it's just kind of a, a tough time. It's a good time for selling, but a tough time for eating it yourselves. Um, so on-farm slaughter is a way to procure meat that the farmers can afford to eat to provide an affordable purchasing option for their neighbors 
and for their employees to buy meat off the hoof and stock their freezers. Most of the farms that I work with are the scale of dairy that is quickly disappearing from the landscape because it is incredibly difficult with conventional or organic prices um, to cash flow a farm with 50 cows or even 100 cows. It's hard to do. Um, I see the finances every day and I know that it's very tight. Um, so the ones that are still making it and exist um, and still exist have to be very creative, honestly. And maybe they don't cash flow on paper, but they make it work in other ways. And one of the ways is on-farm solder. Um, on-farm solder is one of the ways that makes these farms work because it provides an alternative income stream. It provides a way to decrease their own family living expenses, which is big. You know, most of these farmers are not taking, they're not on payroll. So the only money they have to, to live is what's left over at the end of the year. They're not, um, they're not getting paid a salary. Um, so they're able to decrease their own living expenses by utilizing their own farm source food. And it it's a way to decrease overall cash output to processing, which is expensive. Um, On-farm slaughter additionally provides an option that takes much less time, much less of the farmer time in terms of loading and transporting animals, not to mention the difficulty of scheduling USDA slaughter slots within a busy farming schedule with very, very limited labor. You know, these farmers are milking, you know, taking care of animals, haying, doing the books, they're, they're already incredibly diversified. So to add more roles, um, you know, anything to streamline this process is helpful to them and helpful to the, their bottom line. Um, any further restrictions on, far on farm slaughter legislation would negatively impact these farms that already have the odds stacked very much against them. Um, and I have also worked with one, I work with a couple itinerant slaughterers up here, but one um, more extensively. And I have a couple fun numbers for you. So um, he has, his client list is massive. Um, so he works with well over a hundred small and homestead, homestead scale farms, but also over 40 CSFO or larger farms just last year. And that's like, this is just a, um, like, I'm sure there's more. That's kind of like what I have written down. And so last season, he processed around 500 large animals that would have required USDA slaughter slots otherwise. So that's a, that's a massive impact in itself. Um, so just based on that scale of farms, um, that should show you the importance of this work in our farming community, um, the importance in state, in, in on-farm slaughter's impact on state meat processing infrastructure. And overall, it has an incredible and massive impact on our overall working landscape. So thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Celine. Um, and you have one more witness, uh, Caroline? Right. We want to wrap it up with our policy director, Graham Unain Spoof, and I'll take it away, Graham. Good morning, Good Graham. Buddy. Uh, thank you, committee. and. I just want to also say really thank you to everybody who's come to testify before me today, those who are farming livestock for on-farm slaughter, those offering slaughter and processing services, and those supporting those doing those that work like Celine here. Uh, I think it's important to say that these are essential tasks and relationships related to food security, food sovereignty, cultural preservation. We hear from a number of folks practicing halal slaughter who need this allowance. Um, farm and small business viability and climate change resilience. Um, we've talked today about how this work is being threatened now by FSIS and the Agency of Agriculture. And I intend to suggest to you some immediate steps, proactive steps we can take to uh, halt such interpretations and enforcement, which will cause widespread substantial and imminent harm. And I seek today to communicate to you and put for the record some of this widespread and imminent harm, which is being threatened uh, which we will seek through lawsuit to uh, to cease and desist if the state of Vermont refuses to do so. Um, so the ongoing release of new interpretations, their ambiguity and contradictory nature um, with no signed, dated, uh, written documentation justifying any of it is not tenable, it is not equitable, and it's not just for the people being regulated and it will cause significant damaging impacts. Um, the most recent FSIS memo, which hasn't actually been talked about today, goes even more extreme than we've heard from VAFM, um, 
two of the notes say that the personal use exemption requires all owners to be individuals who are involved in the raising of the animal. And the second thing, which is I think deeply troubling is that there is no provision in the statute or regulations allowing the use of third party itinerant slaughterers under the personal use exemption. So make no mistake, itinerant slaughterers operate under the personal use exemption and custom processors, farms and consumers rely upon them uh, and have for generations. So what, what would this mean? So I, I spoke with a couple custom processors this last week and some itinerant slaughterers. So I recently spoke with a custom processor. There are about 40 custom packing plants in the state, registered in the state. At least 15 to 20, I think, based on having to look at the list myself, are you know, somewhat similar to this one. Um, this, this facility processes 15 to 20 beef a week during the busy season and 20 or more pigs. And um, that's in the fall mostly. This individual processed over 200,000 pounds of cut meat last year and about the same the year before. They do not take animals from people who do it themselves, except a few special cases. So this whole thing about owners needing to participate in the slaughter and not being allowed to hire itinerant slaughterers, custom processors mostly will only work with itinerant slaughterers. They provide them almost all of their business. This is an undercount, this person suggested. Um, he said that it's so much easier if the farmer calls him to help arrange, then the itinerant slaughterer can call to arrange the drop-off as well. Um, he talked about how much easier it is if the itinerant slaughterer can deliver the carcass. Already, they're already communicating and keep them on the schedule. Um, and they said that more itinerant slaughterers are asking their clients to deliver the meat to the processor. And this is becoming more challenging from, the, from them from a time perspective, but also a contamination perspective. So, you know, this specific directive, we know that it doesn't actually relate well to food safety um, in and of itself. So let's say if there were only 15 custom processors doing this number of cattle and pigs, and again, that doesn't even consider the lamb and goat and other animals, which we know are harder to find spaces for at USDA inspected processors, but also many custom processing facilities. And also certainly a number of itinerant slaughters I've spoken to don't actually process lamb or goat anymore, but this would be over 3 million pounds. So I extracted these numbers to 15 facilities. that will be over 3 million pounds of processed meat, more than 7,800 pigs annually, um, 7,800 7, cattle annually, and that's based at 10 pigs a week per facility or 10 cattle a week per facility. Those are just estimates. I'm not saying they're, they're necessarily right. Um, but that's just to give you some idea of the overall numbers based on that one business. Um, and even if they're not necessarily accurate based on seasonality, the overall poundage is, is an annual number that that person was tracking. So I didn't have to extract anything from a season, seasonal perspective there. Um, and as Celine and others were saying, it is highly likely that most of this meat stays extremely local, feeding local people who, who need that affordable meat. This processor said that most all of his business is through itinerant slaughters. Um, so we can estimate that most all of these animals in this processed meat is reliant upon those folks. So we do not know the total number of itinerant slaughterers in Vermont. So we can't necessarily estimate the extent of the harm done by these uh, interpretations being offered. But one I spoke to this last week, and Celine just offered some numbers that are well beyond what I'm suggesting here, I believe. Um, this person only slaughters on weekends. He said his numbers are down, and he slaughtered 250 pigs and 100 cattle maybe last year. And again, there's no sheep, goat, alpacas, anything else included in this person's repertoire. He does not understand how itinerant slaughterers or custom processors would stay in business if these interpretations were accepted. So I am also a farmer. I raise grass-fed beef cattle. I have had itinerant slaughters on my farms or farms I have managed for pigs, cattle, and poultry. As a beef farmer, I can speak to how requiring myself or an owner of the animal once I sell it to them live to slaughter that steer on farm without the help of a trained professional would absolutely not be in the interest of food safety or general farm safety or a personal well-being. Uh, these are very large animals. This is a very skilled craft. That's not to, to suggest that people shouldn't be able to and encouraged to study and practice slaughter themselves, but it is to say that requiring people who otherwise do not have the skills or interest, but who want to raise livestock to feed themselves or others does not make any sense. I will also say that I use a USDA inspected processor, a uh, slaughterhouse, and I was called the day prior to six of my beef being shipped last year to say that they couldn't take them. It took three weeks for me to get five of them in and it took months to get that last one in. Um, so I do not understand how these facilities are in a position to take on thousands of more animals needing slaughter every year, especially if they're not even taking sheep and goats, many of them. 
Um, so another thing that Royal Vermont has been doing has been offering educational courses to the community, partnering with Mary Lake and other farms, um, bringing farmers to, to be able to see this, to be able to learn about it. Uh, and we won't even actually be able to offer these edu educational courses in the community anymore if farmers aren't allowed to hire third party itinerant slaughterers under the personal use exemption. So our community members won't even be allowed to learn about this in person. So when we talk about essential skills, we have to also talk about the cultural preservation of them um, and the need for them to be distributed and dispersed throughout our communities in order to do so. So I think lastly, I would just say these interpretations do not protect food safety or food security. They threaten and compromise both from requiring owners to participate in the slaughter and to not hire itinerant slaughterers but requiring them to transport carcasses themselves. If you talk with custom processors, itinerant slaughterers or farmers or owners, you will, you will understand this. They also exacerbate this will also exacerbate problems and eliminate opportunities cited in Vermont's strategic agricultural plan. As Kurt says, who gains? During the pandemic, nearly one third of Vermonters faced food insecurity. Current USDA slaughter and processing facilities and state inspected slaughter facilities cannot meet the current demand. They are very hard to access for smaller producers, and producer, in particular producers of small ruminants, and they certainly cannot meet this increased demand where itinerant slaughterers and custom processors no longer able to operate. This will result in immediate and direct harm to farms, itinerant slaughterers, custom processors, and all Vermonters who rely on the meat business and other things provided for by these people. So rural Vermont is encouraging the state of Vermont, these committees, the attorney general's office, the federal delegation to do everything in their power to challenge FSIS to justify their new interpretations of the law and prevent the imminent and widespread harm that would be caused were this interpretation to be implemented. And remember, this is not just in Vermont, this is all across the country, FSIS's interpretations are relevant. If the immediate, in the immediate and more controllable moment, we cannot require farmers to register for a practice with an agency which refuses to follow the law in relationship to the practice and which has threatened to enforce these FSIS interpretations, which testimony today has shown will cause imminent harm. The Vermont Agency of Agriculture is a partner in its oversight of the facilities they have authority over but they are overstepping their authority here. And they have let it be known that they are willing to be complicit to this harm, even though it is beholden, to, even though they are beholden to enforcing Vermont law. And they are not willing to step up to defend Vermont's law and Vermont's residents, businesses and food security. Either, <clears throat> all due respect to VAFM, we need their support here. And the farmers and custom processors and itinerant slaughterers need their support here in standing up for the law that they are obligated to be implementing. Thank you. I believe that's all I have to offer today. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Graham. And dear committees, before we really wrap it up, I um, I also want to give Katie Wolf a chance to um, offer some of her reflections of the event. Um, Katie has been taking out of her busy schedule time this morning to support uh, one of her customers, Ali Barlow, who you had. The opportunity to listen to her um, her passionate testimony just a few minutes ago. So, Katie, if you have anything to add for us today, um, so from Boondoggle Farm, then we'd be excited to to hear a couple of words from you as well. I'm sure. Thank you, Caroline, um, and thank you everyone for granting time for these testimonies and for everyone who is testifying here. Um, much, I, I concur with um, much of what has been said, um, so I don't want to repeat it, but maybe only add a couple of things from my own perspective. Um, I've been raising sheep and goats for about 10 years and um, took animals to a slaughterhouse once um, and then found Mary Lake and have been working with Mary ever since. Um, I, I can't express fully um, the value added to the Vermont community of having this practice of on-farm slaughter. I have probably 30 customers that, um, that share lambs um, that are slaughtered on my farm. And many of them do come and visit um, and are curious about the process and learning more about this aspect of uh, the food system and Vermont farming. Um, so there's just a huge benefit, uh, I think, to the community. Um, I, as a farmer, as Mary alluded to, have learned so much about rotational grazing, about the health of my animals, um, from being there and, and seeing the animals essentially opened up 
in front of me um, on behalf of my customers. Um, it's been an, a tremendous educational experience for me that I have been able to share with other aspiring farmers. Um, and without that opportunity, it all happens behind closed doors and we are further disconnected from not just our food system, but also um, the welfare of our animals and of the land here in Vermont. Um, my customers would not come, many of them, to the farm to, to do this, as others have alluded to. Um, and finally, there, there are just two other points. Um, part of um, putting together uh, some semblance of financial sustainability um, for a small sheep and goat farmer for me is the processing of their hides. Um, and when, when you use a slaughterhouse, um, you can't always be sure that you're gonna get your hides in a timely fashion to get them salted and cured and preserved so that they can in fact be tanned. It's a, it's a major revenue stream for me. Um, when we practice on-farm slaughter, I'm able to take the hide as soon as Mary removes it, salt it immediately, um, and it becomes again a, a value-added um, uh, thing that I'm able to offer to customers and to create a, a revenue stream. And I know a lot of small sheep farmers um, in Vermont use this as well. Um, Finally, I, I just want to point out my own confusion about the inconsistencies of the recent modification made when the law was sunsetting and the, um, the number of animals was increased from the allowance for personal use exemption was increased from 40 small ruminants to 80. Um, that act seemed to me to be a demonstration of support of this practice. Um, but the, the subsequent requirements that those customers be present as others have elaborated on um, seems really inconsistent with that increase. I, I don't understand how any one farm could um, use, no matter how large your family is, um, 80 sheep in the course of a year for your own personal use. Um, and nor could um, do, or does it make sense for 80 farmers to come, um, 80 customers to come to the farm? So it, it just, it seems to me like there, there's an effort in this legislation to possibly increase food security and safety, which uh, as others have described, it doesn't really work that way. Um, but the, the laws being changed um, it doesn't achieve that goal. So I, I'm confused as to what we are trying to achieve. Um, if it's food safety and security, there are other ways to, to achieve that. Um, if it's restricting small farms, as many others have said, to what end is that? Um, and uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to describe further how the process works, um, but I think others have made it clear and um, <laughs> I, I'm appreciative that this is being considered. I can say absolutely that if these uh, restrictions were enforced, I would not be able to continue doing what I'm doing. I, I already um, cover my costs and, and really don't pay myself um, to do this work. It's, it's more of a, um, a community service and um, a, um, it's a way of life um, for many small farms and it takes a lot and every bit to cobble together any semblance of financial sustainability. Um, so thank you for considering um, writing the legislation so that it actually works. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Katie. Um, we, we have about 10 minutes left before we have to go and visit the house on, um, on hiring new judges or, or um, sustaining new judges. So as Steve Collier, now he answered the very, the very first question uh, of the morning uh, was to Stephen in regards to, has the law changed in the last few years? And, I think he said no, if I 
still remember right. So Stephen's got his hand up and uh, I'd like to, he sat through and listened to the whole issue. He's the attorney at the agency of ag. So Stephen, you have your hand up and uh, so we'll call on you to see what you have to say. Well, thank you, Senator Starr. I very much appreciate that. And I'd like to thank everyone for all, sharing all of their thoughts. I, I, I'd like to try to clarify a few things if I can. Uh, first is we do support on-farm slaughter. We very much support the viability of small farms. Th this is not that issue at all. There is a very important legal issue, which I'd like you to think about because I'm worried about where this is all going in terms of trying to challenge the current law, because the current law, the, the, all of the arguments you make are persuasive. They're all persuasive policy arguments, but I just want to explain the legal framework a little bit. And that is that federal law dictates meat sales in this country. It's the, as you all know, we, ha we have, our agency has a cooperative agreement with the federal government so that we can also administer a state inspected program. Our program has to be equal to the federal program or we can't have it. And I, I think one thing that maybe confuses this issue and, and why there's so much misinformation about it is everybody characterizes this as on-farm slaughter. On-farm slaughter does not exist in federal law. There is something, and, and, and on, on top of that, itinerant slaughterers do not exist in federal law. There is a personal use exemption, which is a very old statute, poorly written, it talks, it's in the singular and it talks about men only because that's how statutes were written at that time. I don't know exactly when it was adopted, but it's probably over a hundred years ago. And it allows farmers to slaughter their own animals and keep those animals within the household. That's all it does. It just allows people who raise their animals to slaughter them and eat them. And, and they can also share those with their non-paying guests and employees. So it's a household exemption. That's the law. FSIS has extended, in my opinion, the interpretation of that law through guidance, which does allow for people to buy an animal from a farmer and slaughter it. And, and, it, and I think it allows for, for multiple people to do that. About in 2013, before the itinerant slaughterer statute in Vermont law was passed, we also, uh, Kathy, Kathy McNamara from our um, meat inspection division was in contact with Phil Durfler, who's from USDA, and he wrote a letter saying that we could have this itinerant slaughterer um, provision in state law that he thought it was consistent with uh, federal law, the personal use exemption. But when everyone makes all of these very strong policy arguments about not wanting the, the individual owners who buy the animal to be involved in the slaughter, we understand that. We know that people don't wanna be involved in slaughter. We know people don't wanna be on the farm, but when you do that, you're writing the personal out of the personal exemption. The whole exemption is for people to be able to raise animals and slaughter them. There is nothing in that exemption for farmers to be able to raise animals, slaughter them and sell the meat. That's actually in direct contra contradiction of federal law, which requires that when you sell meat, it has to be inspected. Now there are viable, there are many viable paths in, in my opinion. One is right now, and this is what I'm worried about, is I'm worried we're gonna push USDA to get rid of, getting rid of the itinerant slaughterer. They don't like it. There's nothing in federal law that allows it. We have one letter from 2013 that says we can do it. We want to continue doing it, but I am concerned that if we push too hard on this issue and USDA is looking at its statute and looking at its need to be consistent around the country, that it's going to backtrack off that. And the reason I'm concerned is that guidance memo, which I don't know who put out in the public, but we never have received that from FSIS. That's not something they've communicated to us. The information we have from FSIS is that we can continue with the itinerant slaughterer program until we hear otherwise, that's what we're going to do. So just keep in mind when you, when all these policy arguments are terrific, but look at the law, look at the regulation. There is nothing about on-farm slaughter. There is nothing ab about itinerant slaughterers. There is just a personal use exemption. So what I think about is the law and our requirement to maintain equality with the federal law. We are 
we are doing that right now. It, people can still absolutely in Vermont hire an itinerant slaughterer. They can still absolutely do that. There is a requirement, and this gets back to the personal, that the individuals, the owners of the animal, actually be involved in the slaughter. None of us like it. It's not that we want this. It's what the law requires and what FSS, FSIS is requiring. So yes, there is a requirement that if you are going to slaughter your own animal, you have some involvement. You have to be present. That's the best we could get out of FSIS. You don't have to, you don't have to be involved in the, in the slaughter itself. There is some reason for that. The reason, I think, the reason there is a personal use ex ex exemption is so that you are assuming the risk of what you eat. When you take the owner out of that act, you no longer know how the slaughter was performed. You no longer know whether there was adulteration. You don't know anything about it. So you're no longer an owner slaughtering your own animal. You're a person buying meat. And so that is the, the issue. So that's one thing is people can just be there. And I know that's unpleasant. People don't want to be there. Whether or not they have to watch it, I, I don't know whether that's the law or not. FSIS said they have to be present. I, th I personally think that if an owner is there, inspects the site, knows what it's like, can evaluate whether or not it's clean, and then doesn't want to watch the actual slaughter, that that probably suffices because you're at least there, you know what happened, you can talk to the itinerant slaughter, you have some information about the conditions that had occurred, and I think you can probably still fit within the personal use exemption that way. Another option is, this is, I mean, what FSIS thinks is this is custom slaughter. When you have somebody who is slaughtering an animal, you can do that for them, and you can deliver it to the owner, you just can't deliver it to people who are not the owners. So another option is that itinerant slaughterers, I know this is expensive, but either the farms who raise the, the beef could be a custom slaughterer or, the, or the, any of the animals, or an itinerant slaughterer could potentially be a custom slaughterer. There is another method, and we are trying to work on that. I think Julie is registered, Julie Bover, our um, division chief, I think she's registered 14 more custom slaughterers in the last year, if I remember that number correctly. Can I ask so, a follow-up question, Stephen, just because in the sake of time, before you start um, with the custom slaughter issue, which is really not the issue here today, um, just a follow-up question. We're really missing in all these agency communications some substantial um, statements about the legality or illegality of our state law. So I have two questions. The first one is, are, is Vermont Agency of Agriculture administering state law or federal law or both? And the second question would be, in administering our state law, what is a substantiated statement from the agency about the legality or illegality of what we do have in state law? And if you think what we have in state law, what we've passed over the last decade in advocacy, which is what our producers are orienting themselves after, they are the, mo the, most, the more specific law is what we are governed by, that is our state law. And that's what producer orient themselves after. If the Vermont Agency of Agriculture thinks what we have in state law and including the institution of itinerant slaughters is, is substantially contrary to federal law, how can, answer that question, how can state agency of agriculture last year support and promote and even suggest the repeal of the sunset on the law? Why wouldn't you let it sunset if you think what we have in state law is contrary to federal law? That's the question. So I just want to finish what I was saying. So the third thing that we can do is change the federal law. The federal law right now is written by Congress. As you know, the regulation uses the same language as in the federal law. That if that law is changed, then the contours for the personal use exemption can, can change. The fourth thing you can do, and people make these judgments all the day, is violate the law. None of us want that. We don't, we, we want everyone to be operating within the contours. We don't write the laws. We are required to enforce them. Back to Carolyn's question, the, one of the things that's so troubling about this is there are viable paths, but misinformation keeps getting sort of pumped out there to taint the ability to construe what the viable paths are. We will work with anyone who wants to work with us to make it as clear as possible exactly what is allowed and what's not allowed under the personal use exemption or the custom use exemption, or if somebody wants to go even farther than that. Can you clarify the misinformation you keep referring to? Because that's a pretty offensive statement given all this information you've been, you've been putting out there with no signed dated documentation and the enforcement you're threatening. 
Well, Graham, I, I don't know what enforcement we're threatening, and I don't know what the memo that I think you're referring to was something that was shared with a congressional delegation. It's not something that we put out there. It's not something we've even received officially. That's, I've the, read best it. We have. That's the best we have right now. Is well, it? It's not. Well, we're not following that. So if that's the best we have, I mean, we are not relying on that memo because we have a relationship with FSIS. We have communicated with FSIS. We talked to them last spring and against this fall, and again, this last fall, in an effort to try to expand the existing allowances under the personal exemption. The, the initial request was, can we do a CSA like animal share herd program? And so we talked to them about that and they said, no, but we'll keep talking to you. And so then we started talking about the personal exemption and we were asking if it's really necessary for individual owners who buy an animal to be present because we were hoping it wouldn't be necessary. They said, this is the law. We do require you to be there. And they also raised the issue of the itinerant slaughter and said, you know, we don't even think you can do this. And we reminded them of the letter that they shared with us in 2013 from their deputy administrator saying that we can. So back to Carolyn's question, we think right now, Vermont law is compatible with federal law, which is the key. We believe that the itinerant slaughter law that was passed back in 2013 and has been amended somewhat since then is in compliance with federal law. But our only reliance on that is a memo from FSIS that they sent to us back in 2013. There's nothing in my opinion whatsoever in the federal statute or in the federal regulation that says anything about itinerant slaughters that suggests that anybody can hire someone else to do the slaughter. It's all about personal use. So we keep trying to push the boundaries of what personal use is. Essentially, we're trying to write personal out of it. And I understand that for all of the great policy arguments that everyone said, but we don't get to interpret that. We don't get to apply it. We get to communicate with the feds and they determine whether we're doing it right or not. So all we're trying to do is make sure that we comply with federal law, or if somebody wants to change federal law, you know, that's a great option, but that's not something that, that we can do. So I, I know I've talked a long time, I'm sorry. I just, I wish that anyone who wants to know how to do this lawfully would just call us because there are lawful ways. There are ways that we can allow. We don't get to decide what those ways are we only get to tell you what they are so that we can work with you to make sure you can stay within the framework. None of us wants to limit any farmer from doing anything, but we do want to make sure that people are doing it lawfully because we don't want to have to enforce. We don't want to have to take any action. We just want to make sure underst people understand what they can and can't do. And then we hope people will choose to, to stay within what they can do because we don't ever want to have to tell someone what you did is wrong, but sometimes we have to. So thank you all for, for listening. Uh, thank you, Steve. And as I started the meeting off, you know, we've been we've been running on, I call it propaganda, stories that people have have told us that aren't exactly accurate. And and uh, that's what we found out. And that yeah, you know, yesterday we went through the law, our our rules and our regs, um, found out they hadn't been changed or there's no process in the works to change them. And, um, you know, that's why we wanted to have this meeting with all you folks to kind of clear the air a little bit and try to figure out if we can alter our, our Vermont law that would be allowable from the feds so that it would make it easier. One, one issue that is not in our rules or regs or our law is that to allow you folks to hire an agent to work on your behalf uh, to get the animal slaughtered. We, that is not in our rules or regs. And we've been thinking about ways of trying to incorporate that so that if you didn't want to be there, you could hire an agent. And it seems like that would make the most sense because then the agent 
could arrange the itinerant slaughter and the butcher that's going to cut the meat up for you because you can't have that sitting around for two weeks waiting for a butcher <laughs> and a freezer uh, ready to put the meat in. So, uh, but, you know, we've got a ways to go and we're going to be around here for another five or six weeks. So I think we would, uh, you know, we'll be able to talk to you folks and others uh, in regards to that issue, but we, federal law will supersede state law any day of the week in regards to food safety and, and especially meat. And, and, you know, we can push the law, but we don't want to cross the line and get into uh, totally against the law. So, that's where we are. The bell is ringing on our end. Uh, but I want to ask any of the committee members, do you have any questions or anything you'd like to add? Nope. Caroline? Uh, Bobby? Uh, Bobby? Yeah. Go ahead, Carol. Carolyn. <laughs> um, I would just like to um, <clears throat> say, and this comes from somebody who has been raising um, sheep for 45 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would like to learn more about what this would mean to, I, you know, and I'm a strong supporter of uh, on farm slaughter. But I would like to know what, would, what it would mean to us if we were to lose our equal to status. And I don't think we can handle that today, but this is something I would like to be um, hearing about from Steve and Julie in the coming days. So, um, I think that's really important for all of us to understand. And with yeah. that, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And to is it, I think this has been really helpful to uh, understand the situation. So thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks a lot to all of you for your time this morning. And and hey, call the agency and push them on what you'd like to do and see if. <laughs> There's a way that that they can work out something with you. If if not, get to us and we can, you know, we write the laws. So, uh, but I told you what we were thinking about and working on. So we'll leave it at that. And um, thank you again very much for your.